There are a number of other remarks that I'd like to make about this basic model that I just presented. First is that this model can be um, applied to a number of different situations potentially. So I presented it in terms of a website uh, or a, um, a portion of the web growing and it's a possible way to explain a power law distribution in the popularity of websites. Popularity as measured by the number of links pointing to that site. And in the development I gave a number of ways of sort of thinking about how this could be, uh, this model could apply to situations where we're looking at popularity. Popularity of books, popularity of websites, popularity of movies, and so on. Um, another setting that this model could be arguably applied to maybe is the growth of cities. So let's say that I live in the country and I decide for economic reasons or cultural reasons or whatever that I want to move to a city. How am I going to choose that city? Well, sometimes I might just choose a city at random. I don't know, this one looks good. But a lot of the times, I'm probably going to go to a city if I already know somebody in that city, if I have a friend or a classmate or a cousin in that city. And so what that would mean then is that I'm more likely to go to a city that already has more people in it because that's where the people I know are more likely to have gone because there are more people there. So that's another example where we could get um, preferential attachment, preferential growth. Those which are already a bit larger are going to keep growing, <clears throat> getting larger still. There's one more uh, possible area of application for this and uh, type of model, and in fact this is historically one of its first applications, and that's to explain the distribution of species in a genera. So in uh, genera, sometimes we have uh, many, many species, and then we also have a lot of genera with very few species. So, uh, and it turns out that that dis distribution follows something sort of like a, a power law. So why might that be? Well, let's think about, um, imagine that a given species has some sort of fixed probability of speciating, sort of a species that splits into twos, and now it's two species now. Um, genera that are already large are more likely to have a speciation event because there are more species in that genera to speciate. So we'll expect to see um, genera that are large get larger still. And then with some fixed probability we could also have every now and again a speciation event occur that's so severe that that new species actually doesn't belong to that genera but is part of a new genus. So um, that's another possible application for this type of preferential growth model. So stepping back, um, this is certainly too simple a model, the one that I presented um, a moment ago, and we can make it more realistic by making it, you know, adding some different considerations and varying probabilities and the like. But I think it's a nice general model that surely explains one of the dynamics uh, associated with a lot of growth processes and processes that lead to long tails or power laws, that there's some sort of preferential growth or preferential attachment. There certainly are a number of mathematical details and subtleties associated with these models. Um, and some of the references that I have in the um, additional resources section for this subunit or for this unit would be a good place to start to learn about um, some of those in a little bit more detail. Another point I want to make about these preferential growth models is that they have a long and somewhat complicated history. And I think this is often the case in interdisciplinary work like this. Here we have a model or a possible general mechanism that can describe species distribution, popularity in cultural systems like books and music, uh, growth of technical systems like websites, uh, growth of cities, and so on. And so it's natural that researchers working in different fields might discover it more or less independently. Uh, I think the earliest example of this type of model was due to Yule in maybe the 1920s, 1930s, and it's been rediscovered um, more or less independently perhaps uh, a number of different times, including by Simon and Price. Uh, I can't possibly do the history of these models uh, justice. Um, 
it's an interesting history. Um, and the place I would recommend to start is a review article by Mitzenmacher, A Brief History of Generative Models of Power Laws and Log Normals. Um, it's a nice paper, and a link to the PDF is included in the additional resources section for this unit. Um, perhaps because of the sort of interesting history that this model and these ideas have been kind of discovered independently in different settings, this mechanism or basic model goes by different names. So it's sometimes called preferential attachment when one is thinking in terms of building links on some sort of a network, be it um, the World Wide Web or a citation network or something. Um, it's sometimes also called more simply preferential growth. It's also a, a rich get richer mechanism because those that already have a little bit more tend to get more still. And it's also sometimes called the Matthew effect from the Bible verse, which is something like from to he who hath shall get. But again, the idea that those that already have are proportionally going to have going to get a little bit more. So there's a pretty wide terminology for this basic, uh, basic idea. There's one more thing I want to talk about before we conclude and move on to another power law model. And that is that these preferential growth models call into question our explanations for success. So when we see that a web page or a book or uh, a music artist is incredibly popular, we might wonder why that is. One logical explanation would be, well, because that artist is really good and she's better than everybody else, or she's a better author, or this is a more informative web page. That certainly could be true. But we've also seen that we can get um, these distributions of popularity, including some runaway hits, some big successes, through a process in which quality uh, doesn't enter in at all, it's all this um, preferential feedback, preferential attachment process that can lead to these sort of runaway successes. Even if we assume, right, in these models, that all the nodes are the same. Um, there's no uh, quality difference between them, but nevertheless, one of them comes racing out on top because it happens to get that initial advantage. So um, there, are, there are these two ideas. Something is popular because it's good, or something is popular because it got lucky and had an early advantage at random, and then its popularity soared off. So it turns out that um, you can actually do some experiments to test the extent to which these two ideas are at play. And it's not an either or, right? In almost surely, it's got to be some combination of those two. The question is, what's, what's the balance? So there's a really nice piece of work um, by Salganik, Dodds, and Watts. It's called a Music Lab Experiment, and there, I put a couple links also in the um, additional resources section, including a link to a talk by Duncan Watts about this work. And let me really briefly describe this. They created an experimental music download site where people could go, sign up, and then download music, um, listen to music, and then if they liked it, they could download it. But unbeknownst to the users, they actually were um, separated into several different sites that looked the same but had some different features. So um, on most of the sites, when you went to download some music, you could see how many times that music had already been downloaded. In other words, you could see the popularity. Um, on other sites, uh, other versions of the site, you didn't have that information. Maybe they just showed in random order and then you listen to a song and then decided if you wanted to look at it. And so across different versions of the site, the question then was, how much influence does this um, seeing the rank, the, the number of downloads, how much does that have on my decision as a user to download something? And if we create different worlds, different sites with the same songs, do the same songs always win? If the, where win means gets downloaded the most. If the main driver of success was the quality of the song, then we would expect to see the same songs winning in different worlds. If the main driver of success was uh, this sort of random preferential growth, then we would expect to see very different songs winning um, in different worlds. So the results 
um, show that both effects uh, are in play, that there's some songs that are always lousy and some songs that always do pretty well, but there's also really strong variation from world to world, indicating that some sort of preferential attachment dynamic, preferential growth dynamic, is also at play. Anyway, I think it's a really clever experimental design. Uh, I think it's really nice work, and if you're interested, I definitely recommend reading some more about it. Um, there's some nice talks about it. It got a lot of popular press, and deservedly so. So in any event, one way of making a power law distribution is through some form of preferential attachment. There's lots of mathematical details and fine print that can give you different exponents or things that are approximately power law, but the general statement that preferential growth tends to give power law or power law-like things um, is, is a solid conclusion. That said, it's most certainly not the case that all power laws arise from preferential attachment. As I mentioned before, there are many different models and mechanisms that can give rise to power laws, and we've seen just one example of them. In the next subunits, we'll look at some other models that produce power laws.